you met God, what would you ask him or her or it? What would you say if you came face to face with God? <laughs> um, well, in the movie Dogma, one of my favorite movies, where it's a movie ridiculing the Catholic Church rather <laughs> harshly, actually, but it's hilarious. Um, somebody does actually run into God. <laughs> and uh, the first question was, why are we here? <laughs> like, what's, what, what's all this about? What, what does this mean? Why did you create all of this? Um, the uh, way that it's phrased oftentimes is you just get, in return, the Buddha smile. You know, just this slightly mocking, slightly warm, understanding smile. Um, well, I think that there is a Western way of phrasing that question. Our senses are limited. Our senses cannot perceive other than what they're capable of perceiving. But we know that there's other stuff out there. I'm staring into a webcam right now, but I know that, you know, a few thousand miles away, there's the Eiffel Tower, and on the other end of the Earth, there's a, I don't know, a Laotian peasant um, sleeping in his house right now. Uh, there's all kinds of things in the universe, and I cannot perceive them. Um, there's also kind, there's also stuff like infrared, ultraviolet light that I can't perceive at all. My body will react to it, but I can't perceive it. Radio waves, you know, there's just infinite number of things that, even if they're right in front of me, I cannot perceive them. Um, now, the universe, okay. What is reality? We have all that ever happened, all that ever will happen. Every possible angle of seeing everything, and you see every constituent part of everything. You see every human thought that has ever been thunk. <laughs> you see every living species in the entire cosmos all at once, and you know everything there is to know about them all in an instant. <laughs> um, that's, you know, I used the term in another video, the singularity. The, the In physics, there's just this idea of the singularity. The universe is just one thing. It's um, a point at which the laws of physics start to fail. Um, <clears throat> now imagine if our senses were capable of perceiving all of that at once, simultaneously. Um, what would that look like? Or look? <laughs> imagine if we could experience it. We could feel the emotions, all the emotions that are taking place in the entire cosmos all at once. All the suffering, all the joy, all the love all the anger, hate, all that kind of thing. Every last phenomenon, every last thing, every last concept, all at once. <laughs> um, that's kind of the same kind of question that you're putting to God. Why are we here? Another way of putting it is, what is the universe? What is this about? Well, um, Hinduism has an answer, I guess. So most faiths do, I guess. But um, I like the version that is revealed in the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna, who is God come down to earth to ex you know, explain reality to Arjuna, sort of our everyman, um, has been trying to motivate Arjuna to get up and essentially live his life, act been telling him, look, you can't just sit there depressed and not do anything. You have to act in this life. If you don't act, you start to rot. You start to die. You just curl up into a defeated ball of nothing. And life will continue to happen no matter how depressed you are. It's going to keep happening. You cannot stop the wheel of existence. You certainly can't stop it or destroy it or anything. It is. End of story. So finally, in a way, he kind of needs to jolt Arjuna out of his lethargy or his, I guess you'd call it, acedia, uh, a lethargic depression, a jumpy lethargic depression that Arjuna is fallen into because of the horrible situation he finds himself in, in the Mahabharata. Um, 
It's just basically what do you do when you just can't handle life anymore is you know what Krishna is trying to manage to get through to Arjuna that there's a way to deal with this. So he says, all right, how about this? How about I show you the universe? How about I show you everything? How about I show you me? Um, <clears throat> you're not going to be able to see this um, clearly now, but I have to change your perceptions a bit. Being God, Krishna could do that. Um, and then you will be able to perceive it all. And the result is, of course, the universal vision, uh, the universal form, or in Sanskrit, the Vishvarupa. Vishvarup. Um, it's described, and I like this old English translation of it, and it's slightly abridged, uh, where Krishna says to Arjuna, Gaze upon me, I manifest for thee those hundred thousand thousand shapes that clothe my mystery. I show thee all my semblances, infinite, rich, divine, my changeful hues, my countless forms, see in this face of mine. Wonders unnumbered, Indian prince. Behold, this is the universe. <laughs> um, well, the result is predictable. Arjuna sees everything at once, and his mind almost gets blasted out. Um, he, you know, he's a mortal man, and even with his newfound divine perceptions, it's too much for him. But he sees everything at once. He sees all the gods together. Uh, he sees and hears everything that has ever happened. He sees his future, his past, everyone's future, everyone's past. Just a big, blasting, massive, mega perception um, that is indescribable. The Gita is very, um, it's very poetic, beautiful language, even when translated into English. I've never read it in Sanskrit, but um, even it hints at, look, this isn't really what, you know, the Vishvarupa is just a glimpse of the immensity that is Vishnu, that is God. Um, and it's, you know, too much for any mortal to, to handle. Um, the Western equivalent, I think, of the Vishvarupa is, say, one of the people from Plato's cave was yanked out of the cave suddenly without warning and tossed up into the sunlight. Um, oh, you know, you, you just, it's far more than he could possibly have ever imagined. Um, well, what if, as I say, um, our senses could pick up everything that was there to pick up? Never mind just seeing the entire universe at once. Just imagine if I could see every atom and differentiate every atom and everything in front of me, every photon, every everything that's just, you know, within, you know, my normal range of perceptions it too would probably blast my mind out. Or if I could actually suddenly experience all of my memories at once. <laughs> um, every perception that I've ever had of anything ever since the moment that I had any perceptions at all, and I experienced them all at once. There's any number of ways to explain the cosmic vision, the universal vision, the one, the monad, or whatever you want to call it. Um, <clears throat> I'll leave a link below to a couple of images that... Um, India has come up with to attempt to come to grips with this term, with this idea. But really, you, you can't, I don't think that there's any way to accurately depict the universe <laughs> as a thing, as a singularity. Um, even science, you have to deal with so many abstractions that by the time you get to actually defining the singularity, it, you, you can only understand it somewhat intellectually. You can't really feel it. Um, <clears throat> now, this goes to the very heart of the idea of God. What is God? Um, because there are schools in Hinduism, uh, and throughout, I would say, Asia in general, let's say, uh, in a pantheistic kind of way, God is the universe. Um, the line from the Gita that everybody is familiar with is, I am become death the shatterer of worlds, hastening the hour that ripens to thy doom. <laughs> That's the line that went through uh, Oppenheimer's mind when the first nuclear bomb went off, so you know we kind of know that one. That's entered into Western pop culture. Uh, in other words, he is death. God is death. God is everything. Um, 
God is everything that ever was, ever will be, etc. And you can, if you could see it all at once, that would be God. Now, how does that stack up against the Western version of God? There's man here, God there, space in between, whatever. Um, the view of Hinduism or the view of theism that I'm depicting now um, is what I would suppose call monistic theism. Um, you think that monism and theism are different things, but in India everything is hopelessly blurred together, although they do have fierce debates over which one is right and which one is wrong, because the, the Gita is actually generally seen as a theistic document, um, kind of like, I don't know, almost seen like the Christian Bible, a handbook to know God, because God is over there, we're here. But you can read this chapter of the Gita, in which the universal form is fleshed out. Um, in the first person, God is saying, I am all of these things. I am everything. Now, how would a Western atheist of, say, Dawkins or Hitchens' ilk come to grips with that view of God? Um... I don't even think that, that that a Western atheist would even say that that has anything to do with God. Okay, then. <laughs> then, what you, then it's time that we reassessed what we mean when we use terms like God. <clears throat> because the Eastern way of things has many different ways of looking at God. What is God? What are God's attributes? What are what is the universe's attributes? What are, what are God's motives? Does God have any motives? Um, because there's other images of God, say of my favorite one, dancing Shiva, where he's simply dancing for sheer joy of dance, and he dances the universe into destruction uh, in order for it to be re recreated. Um, so, you know, that to me, that strikes me as a nice metaphor for the universe itself. It's just a big, endless amount of coming, becoming and passing. The becoming is looking into the wind, looking through the windshield of a moving car that's going forward, and the passing beyond or passing through is looking through the rear view mirror. Or, sorry, the rear view window, the back window. <laughs> um, that's the universe. There's an element, I guess, of that in Pantahai, um, Heraclitus. Becoming and going. Becoming and going. You can never step into the same river twice. That kind of thing. But just imagine that on a cosmic scale. Everything coming into existence and eventually dissipating to create fertility for another coming into existence. It just is after a point. Time starts to collapse. Past, present, and future become blurred and they all become one. Um, that is a idea of God and in a sense you can say yeah that's omnipotent because all power is in the universe therefore the universe is omnipotent <laughs> therefore the universe is God whatever. Um, I don't think that Western materialistic sort of atheism or of the um, scientistic atheism, um, which is kind of the caveat that is attached to our view of atheism, which somewhat dishonestly is disavowed. They say, well, we just believe whether or not there's a God. But then you say, okay, I don't believe in God. So then they throw all this other stuff at you, the rules of logic and um, the laws of physics and all that kind of thing. But I suppose there's a way to even transcend that argument. You would just say, okay, what if I could perceive the laws of physics, <laughs> uh, not actually watch them happening or what watch them acting on the universe. Can you imagine if I could actually see gravity or hear it or taste it or conceptualize it in my mind? Not gravity acting on something, but gravity in and of itself. I can actually perceive it. I can perceive um, direct, I can experience gravity. Not experience gravity acting upon me, but I can actually feel the phenomenon of gravity or taste it or touch it or whatever. Um, that is yet another uh, difficult um, thing for Western scientific atheism 
to come up with or to, 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 to overcome because they just sort of say that gravity is this and it, and it acts on other things and, and, you know, it just is and we have to accept it as that. Well, all right, that's all very well, but if you're going to talk about something, then that thing has attributes. If you're going to use it as a thing, then you're going to have to describe it. You're going to have to show me it. Well, there, you know, one could say that, that our view of the law of gravity is simply a god. That's all that it is. We're putting a law, a name on something that doesn't actually exist in the way that anything else exists. Um, whereas, you know, if you if you broaden the scope of your perceptions, what you're doing is you're saying that there is a thing out there that is super physical, that is um, supernatural. Gravity itself, we can't perceive it. Well, what if we could perceive gravity? <laughs> it would be something along the lines of seeing something supernatural. Um, what if we could perceive everything that there is to be perceived? Well, we would have something along the lines of the Vishvarupa, the universal form. Um, I guess we could call that the monad of the Platonics. Um, and I don't think that that's the kind of thing that one can dismiss as easily as, say, biblical, a biblically literal interpretation of Christianity. Although there's plenty of Hindu literalists, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that there isn't. India is just as superstitious and, you know, religiously brainwashed as anywhere else on, on Earth. Um, but there are traditions that, uh, you know, that say, no, we have to read these things metaphorically or elliptically or as parables. In other words, parabolically. You come at these things obliquely from a parabolic angle, not directly. So you have to illustrate them. You have to put faces on them and names and everything. We do this as well, as I say, with things like the laws of physics, with directions left and right, north and south. Well, what direction is left? <laughs> um, how high is up? That kind of thing. So you just take the sum total of all of this stuff, lump it all together along with the physical universe, along with past, present, and future, and what you've got is everything. And in the Gita... Krishna says, and I think that this is the message that that almost all Hindus agree on, and they agree with <laughs> they agree on very little. One must love it. What do you mean by love it? <laughs> Possessively? Well, there's a gazillion different ways to love the universe. Um, they all tell you not to love something, not to be attached to something. But how about loving the big thing, as opposed to being attached to this and not that? That's generally what we mean by being attached to something. How about we decide to attach ourselves to reality itself? How about if we decide to love reality itself? How about we decide to love past, present, future? How about we decide to love uh, the laws of physics? We decide to love uh, every grain of sand on every beach on Earth. Um, you think that we're incapable of that? I'm not so sure that we're not. Uh, what do you call art? <laughs> uh, art is that, if you ask me. Um, just combine it all together, and you've got at least one of the many conceptions of godness in Hinduism. It's one of my favorite concepts, actually, and um, I, I meditate on it a lot. You know, I just try and imagine what it would be like. Uh, just as a neat little illustration, um, some way uh, of s somewhat coming to terms with things like the universal form. Uh, Hollywood special effects are getting pretty good. I've left a link below to um, a clip from a corny movie um, called The Wrath of the Titans. But what I like is it manages to illustrate the vastness of Kronos and how huge this god is and how puny men are in, in, um, in by comparison to God. And... Um, I like it because, again, it's kind of like the universal vision, but a very puny version, the universal form, um, simply because the Kronos is so gigantic. But just imagine Kronos in the clip below um, being about the same size compared to Vishnu as the humans are compared to Kronos. <laughs> and even that only gives you a glimpse of the... the vastness of Krishna or Vishnu or Ishvara, whatever you want to call them. Um, things like that tend to blow the mind, and of course they were meant to. <laughs>